Um, good morning. Thanks, you guys, for making it out. Um, got a big cr crew this morning. Um, are, are we expecting more? Yeah. Well, that's fine. They'll probably just trickle in. Um, I guess the reason I, I kind of wanted to get started is this this section in the BCSC book is just gigantic. So I mean, there's just there's tons of stuff to go through, and I don't think I'm even going to get through all my slides today. But we'll give it a shot, and and like usual, just um, you know, just interrupt me if you have any questions, any thoughts, anything you want to talk about. Totally fine. Doesn't bother me. I actually I even have the uh, laser pointer and the clicker today, so that's kind of cool. All right, so kind of like we did last week, I always just like to start out with just objectives, you know, like what the heck do we want to accomplish today? Um, so we're going to talk about clinical refractions. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to keep it as practical as possible, but also, um, you know, not just practical, but, you know, I want you to do a well on OCAPs and boards. So, you know, the vast, the vast majority of the material I have is, is just from the BCSC book, you know, things that you guys are probably going to be tested on. There are some things that honestly aren't that clinically relevant, but are in the book. So I wanted to cover it just to make sure that, you know, you weren't taken by surprise. Um, but again, I'll try to make it as clinic, uh, clinically relevant as possible. So we're going to start, we're going to start with uh, retinoscopy, which is a bit of a lost art. Um, you know, in the days that we have, uh, you know, auto refractors and stuff, a lot of times the retinoscope is just kind of thrown to the side, but it's incredibly useful, incredibly useful. I, to this day, I use it all the time. Um, Obviously, it's really good to get an objective refraction determination, even if you're in the ballpark. Um, it's really good about detecting optical aberrations. You know, there, there are a lot of times when I'll get a patient, they'll come in and they'll say, yeah, my vision's a little weird, and they'll, they'll go through all these complaints. Um, it's like, oh, I've tried contacts in the past and can't quite get it right, and glasses seem a little off. And then I'll just do a quick retinoscopy, and within three minutes, I know they've got keratoconus. You can totally tell. You know, you've got the weird like scissoring reflex, the reflex is really irregular and weird, and you can tell that fast, like, oh, irregular cornea, they've got keratoconus. Um, it, it's surprising how often that happens. Um, it's really good at detecting opacities, like PSCs are really easily seen using retinoscopy. Um, sometimes if you're, you know, before you start a subjective refraction and you do a quick retinoscopy, you can see this big giant PSC centrally and you kind of know, well, you know, if, if their BCVA is reduced, um, you'll know why. I mean, you know why even before you start the refraction. <clears throat> um, retinoscopy is obviously, whoa, hold on. I just messed something up. Well, laptop H. Sorry. Uh, projector on screen down. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Um, anyway, obviously, it's really good for infants. We see a lot of infants over at the... Um, the optometry uh, section, we see a lot of aphakic infants. Um, obviously, that's crucial for that. Um, or, or just kids that are wiggly. Or, you know, um, we had a, uh, a patient this week who has a self-induced traumatic cataract. He also has Down syndrome. It, re it was really sad, really heartbreaking. But he's, he's doing some self-induced trauma. And anyway, I mean, with, with, with a patient like that, there's no way, you know, you're going to be able to go through subjective refraction and ask them what's better, you know, one or two. You have to rely on your retinoscopy and, and get as close as you can. Um, or, kind of like I said, there are some adults that are just simply terrible at subjective refraction. Just terrible. And, you know, you'll, you'll change it by a diopter and they'll be like, oh, it looks the same to me. And you're like, no, it's not the same. I know it's not the same. <laughs> um, so when you're using your retinoscope, I guess I probably should have brought one, use, use the plano mirror setting. That basically means just put the sleeve all the way down. Have you guys gone through retinoscopy? You guys have, generally? Okay. Um, and I kind of assume that, that you've gone through it at least a little bit. But, you know, you put the sleeve all the way down, um, have the patient fixated on a large distance object just so they can relax their accommodation. Um, you know, I have a look at 2400 letter a lot of times. Um, and then, uh, you, you know, you start doing it. And with kids, there are a lot of times you might need to cyclopleach them. Um, you know, you'll get a kid with kind of mushy VA you know, you're pulling out maybe one diopter of refraction, but their, their vision's like 2040, kind of a mushy 2040. A lot of times you have to cycloplegia them. You do retinoscopy and then you go, oh wait, they're actually a plus 450 or whatever. Um, that, that can definitely happen. You know, there's, there's basically three types of reflexes. There's with, and then there's against, and there's neutral. Um, and all this involves the far point. We'll talk a little bit more about the far point in a little bit. 
but basically, you know, the farthest away the point can, uh, farthest away point that your eye can see without accommodation. Like if your accommodation is totally relaxed, what's the farthest point that you can see clearly? That's your far point. And like I say, we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, in that case, you know, if, if the far point is between me and the patient, so the patient's far point is between us, then I'm gonna, when I do retinoscopy, I'm gonna see against motion. You know, I'm gonna shine that light and it'll go against the motion that I'm doing. Um, if the far point is behind me, um, then the light moves in the direction of the sweep, meaning I'm gonna see with motion. You know, you'll see that with hyperopes and, and emetropes. Um, if you're doing it and, and you know, you see the neutrality, which basically means not much of a motion one way or the other. It doesn't look with, it doesn't look against. It almost looks like there's this kind of bright flash of light. That's neutrality. You know, that, that's, that's kind of where you want to be. Um, <clears throat> then if, if you were doing that and you found neutrality, then if you got closer and closer and closer to the patient, you would see with motion. If you got farther and farther and farther from the patient from that point, you would start seeing against motion. Um, Anyway, um, oh, I'm sorry, I think I said that wrong. If you're, moving, if you're moving farther back, you see against. If you're moving closer, you'll see with. Sorry about that, I, I switched that. Um, because again, the far point is gonna be either behind you or in front of you, depending on where you're sitting. And sometimes that's a strategy you can use. If you're finding about neutral, and you're like, I think I'm about neutral, you can actually scooch up a little bit and see if the reflex changes, and then scooch back a little bit and see if the reflex changes and, and reverses. Um, so this is kind of a kind of a dumpy drawing, but you get the idea. Um, so here's the little retinoscope there. So we just got a patient who's just totally plano. So you know the, the far point is going to be, you know, behind me as an examiner. And so as I'm looking at that, I'm going to see with motion because the person the person you know is emetropic. And this is assuming that I've got you know either plano in the phoropter or no phoropter at all. You know, I'm just trying to get in their eyes. Um, same thing with hyperopes. You know, the far point, you know, well, it's technically behind the eye, but it, it's kind of beyond infinity as well, which gets really confusing. But basically with the hyperope, if you've got nothing in front of them, you're gonna see with motion. Just keep that in mind. You will see with. You know, again, these little kids, you shine it in, you'll see this really strong with motion. You know for sure they're gonna be hyperopic. And then kind of the most common situation is the pa patient's myopic. So you can see, you know, the far point is between the examiner and the patient. And so in that sense, you're saying against motion. Um, just to kind of put these things in perspective. So, a uh, quiz. So you're using a retinoscope on cloid, your two-diopter myopic patient. Um, if you were sitting 100 centimeters away, what motion would you see? So I guess the, the first you know, thing you want to look at is, so cloid, where is cloid's far point? And because he's myopic, you know, we talked about how cloid's far point is gonna be, you know, sitting in front of him because he's a minus two. So when his eyes are completely relaxed, his, you know, his clearest vision is gonna be about right here. He's a classic, you know, minus two myope. And uh, so you'll say, all right, so his far point is the inverse of that, it's one over two. So Cloyd's far point, one over two. So his far point's at 0.5 meters or 50 centimeters. So this is his clearest spot of vision because you just take the inverse of of whatever their uh, um, refraction is in, in diopters. And so, if, if his far point's at 50 centimeters, but you're sitting 100 centimeters away, you will see against motion. So you're sitting there 100 centimeters away, he's got nothing in front of his eyes, and you go, oh, I see a little bit of against motion, and so you know he's gonna be myopic, um, without him saying a word. Go ahead. But if you go to his far point, you would see neutrality. Right? That's exactly right. So basically, if you scooted up 50 centimeters and, and you were at that 50 centimeter you know, far point, neutral. Yeah, you, you would see no motion. Um, and then I guess if you scooted up even closer, which would start getting a little creepy, you would start to see with motion. Um, all right, and then, um, yeah, 50 centimeters you see neutral. At any distance close to the 50 centimeters you would see with. Good. Um, so this is, this is really, really important. Because um, even if you're not that great at retinoscopy, there are some little clues you can pick up to really help you to know how close you are. So, you know, example of the speed. If you go in and, you know, you're doing retinoscopy and you see this 
really slow, kind of mushy against motion, you know you have a ways to go. The closer you get to neutrality, the faster that motion's gonna get. You know, you, you, you do the sweep, and then if it suddenly goes against you, but it goes really fast, you know you're getting close. You know, the closer you are, the faster the reflex speed. Brilliance is really good too. A lot of times we'll have these kids, you know, and they're wearing a, you know, a plus 27 diopter contact lens. And a lot of times, you know, they're wiggling, they're moving around, and you can't really tell much of it's with or against motion. But if you can get at least a sense of how brilliant and bright that reflex is, that gives you a really good idea how close you are. There have been times when they're, I mean, there are two-year-olds, they're super wiggly, and I have to kind of just base it on how brilliant was my reflex, how close are we. Um, and, and kind of just a little clinical pearl, with reflexes are usually brighter than against. And so, um, you know, if while you're, while you're using the phoropter, if you give the patient too much minus, sometimes that helps because you're like, oh, I see a really bright with reflex. So that means I have to add some plus. Um, and then the reflex broadens as you approach neutrality. That's important. That's a little trickier to kind of get a handle on, but that is kind of a good thing to know. It'll get, it'll get broader and broader the closer you are to that sweet spot. Um, so as you guys all know, if you see with motion, then you have to add plus. If you see against motion, you add minus. That's just a rule, uh, you know, just to, to remember. Um, add plus if you see with, add minus if you see against. Um, so working distance. So this is something that it's really commonly forgotten about. Um, sometimes you can really mess yourself up um, if you forget about working distance. And this all depends on how far away you're sitting from the patient. And it's an inverse relationship. So if you see this, this uh, you know, cool little chart here. So if you're sitting 50 centimeters away from the patient, then subtract two diopters. Or 100 centimeters away, then subtract one diopter. So say you find, find neutrality at a certain spot, but you're sitting 100 centimeters away, then the actual prescription is one diopter less. And we'll do an example of that. And I'm sure you guys have gone through this before. Um, so you're examining your patient, Kim. I actually had a friend in college. Her name was Kim, spelled C-I-M. Uh, <laughs> this is paying homage to her. Uh, you're sitting 67 centimeters away, and you find neutral with a plus five. So in the phoropter, there's a plus five in there. And you find neutral, it's not with, it's not against, it's this kind of flash of light, it's neutral. So what's Kim's actual Rx? Well, you know, you're sitting 67 centimeters away, um, so that's one over 0.67. 1.5 diopters. And so if you're finding a plus 5 in the phoropter, you have to subtract 1.5 diopters. So her actual Rx is plus 350. I have a question. Sure. So if, if when you subtract the working distance, you're basically subtracting the distance where you have the retinoscope, retinoscope in front of the patient's eye, correct? Mm -hmm. And so that's theoretically saying that the, the power is now exactly on the eye. And so there's that portion of the vertex distance. Correct. And so is that technically the correct prescription for that person when you have to add on a vertex distance? So we're, we're going to get into that, but, you know, when you have, that's a good question, when you have the phoropter on, the phoropter typically sits about 12 millimeters from the front surface of the eye, which is about the same distance as glass <coughs> glasses do. So you want to make sure the is not too close or too far from the patient because that will change. Um, but if the phoropter is sitting about the standard 12 millimeters from the eye, then yes, you can trust that plus 350. Um, now in context, that changes, and we'll, we'll talk about that too. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that's a good way to think about that. And that's a good thing to be careful about, because sometimes you know, I do retinoscopy, and then I look over the patient, and they're sitting back like, a, like six inches from the phoropter, and I'm like, all right, that's, I cannot trust those numbers at all. <laughs> um, all right, and then, you know, just another example, you know, you're examining Bertram, you're sitting 100 centimeters away, you find neutral with a negative 350. By the way, I like, I like, I told you last week, I like just putting up unusual names. Uh, I don't know why, it's just, it's just better than like John and Larry and the, the typical ones. So same kind of a thing, um, 100 centimeters away, so you go one divided by one, because it's 100 centimeters and you're converting it to meters. Um, so it's one diopter. So if you're finding a 350, you subtract one, the Rx is minus 450. This is for glasses. Same kind of a thing. Okay, so for retinoscopy, so the, the eye is made up of two principal meridians, as you guys know. 
Um, and, and just when you're going through and you're using your endoscopy, you try to neutralize the least plus axis first. And then that, sometimes that's hard because you're like, well, how am I supposed to know that? Well, you know that for when you rotate the streak 90 degrees and then you find width motion. That's when you're, when you're refracting in plus cell or doing retinoscopy in plus cell. That's what you want to find. You want to, you want to neutralize one meridian, flip it 90 degrees, neutralize the other meridian, but find plus when, you, when you're doing that and then add cell to it. Um, so I think I've got, yeah, here's an example. So you're doing retinoscopy on, on an aphakic child. So the streak is oriented horizontally, so it's like this, and you're moving it up and down. So basically what you're doing is you're finding the power in the vertical meridian, right? Even though your streak is horizontal, moving it up and down, you're finding the power in the vertical meridian. And you fly, find a neutral reflex with a plus 22. So you're saying, all right, well you guys know what power crosses are, right? You've done that? Okay. Basically it's power cross. This shows the power of the principal meridians of the eye. So, your, so your, your scope is going up and down like this. You find a neutral reflex with a plus 22. So that means you found a plus 22 here. Then you orient the streak vertically and you get a neutral reflex here with a plus 27. And then you're like, okay. So, and, and it's funny, to this day, I won't even think about working distance. I'll just write down the numbers that I get and I'm like, I'll just figure out my working distance later. Um, but in this case, there's a working distance of 50 centimeters. So what is the distance Rx of the child? So you figure 50 centimeters, you reverse that, so 1 over 0.5. 1 over 0.5 is 2. And you know, you're, you're sitting 50 centimeters regardless of however you have the streak oriented. So you basically have to take away two diopters from each meridian. And so the power cross now looks like this, plus 20 and plus 25. And so what that means is the final Rx is plus 20, plus 5, axis 90. That's the child's Rx. Okay, any questions about that? Kind of straightforward? Okay, good. All right, so <laughs> we, had a, we had a fun discussion about this yesterday. This is called the astigmatic dial technique. Um, this is, I'm kind of starting to get into a few other things, you know, how to, how to start, you know, finding the amount of astigmatism. Um, I had my two residents and one of my students, we were talking about this yesterday, we were trying to figure it out. I used this once in school, I've never used it again. But there's a section on the book, so I just said, well, let me just cover it really quickly. Basically, you show them this, this kind of goofy dial, and then they're, you're going to say, which orientation of lines is the darkest and, and blackest? And they'll tell you, horizontal or, or, or vertical or, or one of the clock hours. Um, you fog the patient, you identify the blackest and sharpest lines, and then this, this is having to do with minus cylinder refraction. I sat down and tried to do the optics and the math if you're doing it with plus cylinder refraction, and it's a lot more confusing. You don't just reverse it. Anyway, if you are doing minus cylinder, you add, you add minus cylinder with the axis perpendicular to the blackest and sharpest line. So if they say that horizontal line is blackest and sharpest, you orient your axis at 90, and then you add minus cylinder until it looks equal and then you kind of unfog the patient. And that gives you a rough idea of how much astigmatism the patient has and roughly where it's oriented. Again, not really ever used, but you might get a question on it. Um, this is by far the more common method is the, is the Jackson cross cylinder. And you guys all, I mean, you guys know that, you know, the Jackson cross cylinder, that up there, I guess I'm gonna point here. You know, that little guy right there. Um, so that's what a Jackson cross cylinder basically is on most peropters. There's a plus 25 there, minus 25 there. Um, and when you're doing subjective refraction, you want to start by refining the axis before you refine the power. So you want to find what the axis of the prescription is before you figure out the power in most cases. Um, so you position the JCC's principal meridians 45 deg degrees away from the correcting cell. It's called straddle the line. So in this case, so you suspect that their astigmatism is around this 180 you know, ballpark. And so you want to figure out the axis first. So you make it so white dot, red dot, it's, it's kind of right in between the axis 180. And you know, it locks into that little position. And then you, know, you chase the white. You ask them what's more sharp and clear, number one or number two. And then you follow the white. You know, say in this case, uh, you say what's more sharp and clear, one or two. And, and like this, they say, well, number two, and this is number two here. Well, then you're going to turn this dial like that, so it's going to orient it closer towards the 15. 
And you ask them again, one or two, and you, you keep chasing that white there. So that's refining the axis. Now refining the power is you know, kind of the other one. Basically, you align the JCC with the principal meridian of the correcting lens. So you basically say, OK, now that we know roughly where the, the, uh, the, the axis is, uh, we're going to see how much power is, is, is in the cylinder there. So you refine it. You see the white here. And that's parallel here with the, uh, the axis. And you've got the red here. It's perpendicular. You keep, you keep adding. You keep chasing that white. If they like the white, you keep adding more power. Um, and you guys have all done that before, right? OK, good. When you're finding the axis, what amount of cylinder do you usually start with? So that's a good question. If you have no idea what it is, I always start here with 0.5. Okay. Because if you try to find the axis with 0.25, it's, it's a lot trickier. You always have to go at least 0.5. And say they don't have any cylinder at all, even with 0.5, you'll still be able to find it and, and eventually you'll kick it out, but always at least 0.5. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, the reason I said that you almost always start with finding the axis is because say a patient's got four diopters of astigmatism, but you don't know that, and you just pop in, you know, 0.5 here, it's going to be tough for them because they've got so much astigmatism. Sometimes you have to try to, you know, pop in a little bit more power here, and then it gets easier for them to find that, that axis. Uh, you know where that is. But that's rare. Just if you, if you have no idea, just start with 0.5 and you can usually get there. Okay. Um, now, remember, as you're adding power to the cell, you know, don't forget about spherical equivalent. Um, you know, every 0.5 change that you add of astigmatism, you have to make a 0.25 change in the sphere. I mean, and you guys know this, this equation. Spherical equivalent is the sphere plus the cylinder over 2. So you've got... Um, like Alzada's Rx here is plus 2 plus 3 axis 180. What's the spherical equivalent? Well, you have a plus 2, and then you get the cylinder component plus 3, and you, and you divide that by 2. So 2 plus 3 over 2 is a plus 350. So that's the spherical equivalent. Um, and that becomes important in, in a, lot of, a lot of things with you know, glasses and contacts. And like, like, for example, here's an example. Um, we had a patient yesterday. Um, the, um, he had 2.75 diopters, plus 2.75 diopters of astigmatism, but I kind of felt like, well, I guess he was wearing contacts, but if we gave him that much astigmatism correction right off the bat, I think that was gonna drive him crazy. Sometimes you can't give the full astigmatism or else it's just, it just really kind of messes people up. So what I did is I cut that plus 2.75 down a little bit to plus 2.25. So I basically took out some plus um, and, and so, did, so when, I, when I, I took out some plus basically meaning um, I went from a plus 275 to a plus 225. So to compensate for that, I had to give them 0.25 more minus in the sphere to compensate for that. Okay? Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. So it's the, the directionality of the 0.25 that you take off. If you're adding uh, some plus, you just add more minus. Yes. Okay. Yeah. If you're adding more plus, in the, I guess I, I think I might have told you on my example. In, the, in this case, I basically took away the plus, so I, I added an extra quarter of plus in a sphere. Yeah, so basically, if you, if you take away plus in the cell, you add plus in the sphere and vice versa to kind of compensate for that change. Because say you take out two diopters of plus cell, well, and then, then suddenly you've added a lot more minus than they need, so you need to compensate for that by adding it back into the sphere component. So just, yeah. So you're, you're changing the sphere as you're cranking up on the cell. Yes. So you're checking the cell specifically. Yeah. So say they keep wanting cell. They got plus one, plus 125, plus 150. You know, as you're doing that, you're adding a bunch of plus. So I'm taking away plus or adding minus in the sphere component. Same thing. Just to make sure the spherical equivalent. Like in this case, you try to make sure that as you're going through this, the spherical equivalent stays a plus 350. So that, that's a good thing. You know, say I decided to change this Rx to a plus 250. I'm basically adding minus here, so then I add a plus quarter here, so plus 225. So there you have it. All right. So, um, so refining the sphere, basically you want the strongest plus or the weakest minus that yields the best VA. Um, so you basically try to reduce the plus sphere until optimal VA is reached. You know, watch out, because a lot of times patients make this comment. They're like, 
uh, you know, what's better, one or two, or what's clearer, they'll say two. And they say, oh, and also it's darker and smaller. You don't really want that. You don't really want the patient to say that it's darker and smaller because that probably means you gave them too much minus. Um, especially kids. I mean, kids will just, they'll eat minus, they'll eat tons and tons of minus. I mean, their, their actual Rx is like a minus two, but you know, you're giving them minus three and they're like, oh, I love this, this is really sharp and clear. That's just because you're over minusing them and they like that dark and clear um, appearance of the letters, but ultimately that's not gonna do them any good. They're not gonna like that. Um, now, one of the tests to make sure that you're not over minusing is called, it's the duochrome test. I actually use this all the time. There's this, um, um, what's the word? Acronym, RAM, RAM gap, rad add minus, green add plus. Green has shorter wavelengths, red has longer. Green wavelengths focus anterior to the red. I'm gonna show you a picture of this. Oh. So you guys have seen this before. It splits the, the chart between green side and red side. And then basically, you ask the patient, well first you fog them, so first you'll add a quarter of plus, maybe 0.5 of plus, and you'll say, all right, now there's, there's black letters on the red side and the green side. Where, where do they look darker and, and blacker? That, that's what you'll ask them in this case. Like, what side do they look darker and blacker? In this case, you do want to know that. And if you look at the optics here, so, you know, red, longer wavelengths, focus here. Green, shorter wavelengths, focus there. So in this case, they'll say, hey, the red letters, you know, on the right side, the red letters are darker and blacker. So what, what basically you're doing is you've created this, because this red hits right on the retina. And so the, the letters look darker and blacker and clearer than the green. And so, you know, we use that little acronym RAM gap. By adding minus, you're basically pushing both of those lines, you know, backwards beyond the retina. And so it basically focuses the green right there. Then green becomes darker and blacker as you're adding minus. Um, we'll go back. So in an ideal world, you know, in, in a perfect world, you want it kind of exactly right between the red and the green. That's kind of a nice prescription for most people. Um, if they're presbyopes, maybe you want to fudge a little bit more toward the red. But um, this is a really good way to find out if you're giving someone too much minus or too much plus. Sometimes if I've over plus, they'll say, oh my gosh, that red is so dark and black and that green, I can't see anything. And I'm like, oh, I have to add some minus because I've given them too much plus. Um, now, I, I, the ideal prescription if, if you have what you think is the right prescription in front of the phoropter and you'll say, okay, what's darker and blacker? Usually they'll say, well, it's pretty close, maybe the red. That's usually the best. When they say that, that's beautiful. When they say, it's really hard to tell the difference, but I'd say maybe the red's a little darker and blacker because that means you're not over minusing them. Um, and, and usually if someone's over plus a tiny bit, they usually tolerate that better than if they're over minus, at least anyone about 30 years old and, and, and older. Um, with kids, you know, it's not quite as important. Like if you've got a 15 year old and they're like, well, it's pretty close, but maybe green, eh, you're fine. I mean, you're, you're, you're probably right, you know, close to there or kind of right in the middle and, and they'll be fine. Why do you fog them first? So you fog them first just to make sure, because um, in, in an ideal world, you'd want them to say red is darker and blacker first. Because say, say you don't fog them and they're like green, so you have to add plus, green, you have to add plus. You kind of keep adding plus and it can kind of mess up the patient. You want to fog them first, basically to knock out accommodation. So accommodation is not a factor there. If you add plus, they're not accommodating anymore because if they accommodate, it's going to make it even worse. So it forces them to not accommodate. I guess that's the better answer is we're knocking out accommodation and then you, you add minus from there. No, that's more like 0 0.5 or a point quarter. Like if I've got my prescription and I say, I think we're pretty close, and then I, I start the red-green test, I'll usually add, depending on the patient, I'll usually add two clicks of plus, you know, 0.5. And then almost always they'll say, oh yeah, red is darker and blacker. And then I add a little more minus until it's pretty much equal. Um, yeah, so fog them just by a quarter or 0.5. And, and, and a lot of these things with subjective refraction, you can never go wrong with adding a little extra plus because then it just knocks out their accommodation, especially if they're a kid. Because you don't want to deal with, with this and trying to monkey around with, well, how much are they accommodating as well? You just want to make it so accommodation is not a factor. Okay. Um, <coughs> there's also, now in, in terms of balancing the eyes, this is an issue too, because sometimes you have kids where, especially if they're hyperopes, 
you know, say you've got a kid who's plus four and plus 150, and he or she is just constantly accommodating all day. And you find, you, you find their Rx, but this is really a plus four, but you're finding like a plus 250 or a plus two. And they're like, oh, that's fine, that's nice and clear, and they're just actually accommodating through it. You wanna make, you wanna make sure you're balancing the eyes. Um, this fogging technique, I don't even talk about it, no one ever uses it. This is a, a really good way to balance the eyes is using what's called prism dissociation. Basically, you're adding vertical prism to each eye, and I'll show you an example of this. And then you add plus to the clearest image. So let me show you this. So patient's sitting there, you put a base down over the right eye, I believe, yeah. You put a base down over the right eye and you put a base up over the left eye, okay? Um, you fogged them a little bit, you know, again, a knockout accommodation. I've added like a quarter or a plus 50 and I say, all right, you're seeing two lines of letters. Which line of letter is sharper and clearer? And in this case, this patient says, well, the top line is more sharp and clear. I like that. Well, the right eye is the one that has the base down prism. And remember, if you have base down prism, everything's reversed. If it's base down prism, the image is up. If it's base up prism, the image is down. It's always opposite. And so in this case, the patient says, well, top line is more sharp and clear. The right eye has the base down prism. So this is what the right eye is seeing, and this is what the left eye is seeing. Um, and what you have to do is you add a quarter plus in the right eye until both eyes are equal. So basically, you're trying to make the right eye just as blurry as the left eye at this point. So, you, so they're saying, hey, this is nice and sharp and clear. You keep adding plus. Pretty soon they'll both be kind of blurry, equally blurry. And they'll say, hey, that's pretty close. You take out the prism and then you unfog them. You know, you add that 0.25 or, or 0.5 of minus to get them where they need to be. Um, this is a good way to make sure the eyes are balanced with each other. Does that make sense? Now, it's a little confusing. You kind of have to run through it with a patient a couple times to kind of get it and to kind of see what's going on. But that just is kind of... You know, that's a really, really common way to make sure that they're, they're pretty balanced. And you do the fogging again just to not have a Yeah, I'll add 0.5. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, One question about that. So after you rebalance them or you fog them in your nozzle, would you adjust your sill? To I probably wouldn't. Okay. I'd, I'd probably keep whatever sill I had just the same. Okay. Yeah. Because the sill axis and, and power should kind of already be set by then. Okay, good question. So just a final word on subjective refraction, and I feel like this is extremely clinically important. Every quarter of change is approximately equal to one improved line in VA. So for example, you have Hedwig here, his habitual RX and VA in his right eye is a minus 150. So he comes in with minus 150 glasses, and he sees 2030 with them. Adding a quarter more minus um, should get him to about 2025. And another quarter should get him about 2020. So when you refract them, you'll probably end up with about a minus two. Um, and that you see that every day, all the time. So roughly for every quarter you add, it improves by about a line, give or take. I mean, if the patient comes in seeing 2070, then that usually you throw all the rules out the window. You don't really know what. But um, if if their vision is is approximately you know 2070, 2060 or better, then that's a really good rule to follow. Just because, you know, I work with students a lot over the VA, and a lot of times, you know, they'll say, hey, their habitual Rx is minus 150, but today they're minus three, uh, you know, but they came in seeing 2030, and I'm like, I don't think so. If they came in seeing 2030, that's pretty good. I doubt you'd have to add an extra diopter and a half to get them to 2020. You're looking at more like 50, maybe 75. But I was just telling them, you know, back off a little bit, add a little more plus, let them sit there for a second. I'm sure they'll see just fine. In that situation, if they ask for minus three and you just say that in your mind you think, well, I'm probably going to go for minus three. Mm -hmm. Is there eating at the minus? Yep. Okay. Yeah. And of course, that's not very common in someone who's 75 years old. But, um, I mean, there are, there are even Presby hopes that they'll eat a lot of minus. Um, a, a lot of times, you know, say in this case, the patient sees, you know, you're like, well, you know, they're not, they're not seeing quite the sharp 2020 I want, so I kept adding minus. A lot of times it just takes a little patience, you know, show them the minus two, give them a second, and they're like, oh yeah, I can see it's 2020. Because basically they're relaxing their accommodation, kind of settling in, in and saying, all right, I actually can see well. Okay. So again, far point. Um, 
like we said before, the farthest away, the eye can see clearly with accommodation entirely at rest. The book, there were, it was all over the whole chapter, and that's why I'm covering it a couple times. Um, for myopia, the far point is between infinity and the patient. For hyperopia, technically the far point is behind the retina. It gets a little confusing. Um, but basically, to correct an eye with any sort of prescription, the correcting lens must place its image at the eye's far point. So basically, you know, say you got a two diopter myope, you're basically creating like the image of a street sign or something in infinity here at the patient's far point, which is the sharpest vision they can see without accommodation. So the image of the far point becomes the object that's focused on the retina. Let me show you this. So classic myopia, eyeballs too long. You're looking at an, in, an image of infinity. It focuses in front of the retina. The far point for this myope is actually here. So the sharpest their vision is is you know, about arm's length right there because that focuses everything on the retina. You put glasses here and you're basically creating an image here at the patient's far point that hits exactly on the retina. That's basically what you're doing with glasses. Um, okay, vertex distance. Um, changing the position of the correcting lens changes the relationship between F2 and the eye's far point. I'm talking about, for right now, we'll just talk about glasses. We're talking about like where glasses sit on, on people's eyes. It's really, really, really important if your prescription is any more or any less than about a plus five or a minus five. Standard glasses vertex, 12 millimeters. Um, and it's even more critical for contact lens prescribing, which I don't know if we'll get much into that today. But anyway, so you've got Alonzo here. So he wears plus 10 glasses um, and that's set 10 millimeters in front of his eyes. If he prefers to wear those lenses at five millimeters in front of his eyes, what power should you prescribe? So he basically comes in, he says, doc, these glasses are perfect. My vision's awesome, you know, but I wish I could hold them closer to my eyes because when I do that, my vision's not as good. You say, all right, well, what do I do? So first of all, you have to figure out the focal length of whatever you're dealing with. So he's got a plus 10 lens. What's the focal length? Here's the standard prescription. D is 1 over F. D is 1 over 10. So his, the, the focal length of the lenses he's wearing is 100 millimeters. Okay, I'm going to show you this kind of horrific drawing. Go with me here. Okay, go with me. Uh, this this is, is probably kind of the, the most arduous part of the, the lecture. So, so run with me for a second here. Um, but again, I, I was going to kind of cruise through this, but there was a lot of stuff in the book about this, so I felt like, if they emphasized it a lot, I probably should too. So here, so we've got the lenses, the lens he walked in with, right? It's plus 10. So if he says, hey, my vision's really clear with this plus 10, you know that for a hyperope, the far point's at 90 mil nine millimeters. How do you know that? Well, you know that because this is a plus 10, and we just found that the focal length is 100 millimeters of that lens. Far point for a hyperope is behind the eye. But you know, this lens is sitting 10 millimeters in front of the cornea. And so the far point is 90 millimeters behind the cornea. And that doesn't change. Because that, that's, just, that's just where the far point is for this particular patient. And if he says, all right, well, I want to move my, my glasses from that point to this point. Well, the far point doesn't change. It's still here. And so you're saying, well, what's this distance here? You know, you're subtracting it by 5, so this distance is 95 millimeters. And so you're saying, all right, so what lens <coughs> has a focal length of 95 millimeters. You do the same equation, D is 1 over F, 1 over 0.95, 10.5. So basically, the glasses that would suit him the best if he likes to hold it, put it that close to his eyes, a plus 10.5, okay? Because if, you, if you're a hypro, when you bring glasses closer to you, it essentially makes them weaker. That's essentially what they're doing. And so to compensate for that, you have to make the glasses stronger. That's why 10.5. So we'll do, we'll do an example of a, a myo. So you've got Doshia, and she wears negative four glasses that sit five millimeters in front of her eyes. Due to recent popular trends, she wants to wear them 10 millimeters in front of her eyes. What would be the best Rx? So again, she's minus four. So where, um, so the focal length of the lenses she's wearing is she's like, hey, these glasses are really sharp. I really like them. I just wish I could pull them out a little bit farther. They're too close to my eyes. They, my eyelashes brush against them. And that's a common thing that happens. So the focal length is 25 centimeters. Okay, now with this picture, remember with the myo, the, the far point is in front of the cornea. It's between infinity and the cornea. So a patient's vision is nice and clear with the minus four lens at five millimeters. The far point 
is 30 millimeters in front of the cornea. Okay? So basically, here's this, here's the cornea, minus four, nice and clear. Okay? Um, the power of the lens, so you're basically saying we're moving it from here to here, the far point stays the same, so the length now here is 20 centimeters. And then you're saying, all right, what power of the lens has a focal length of 20 centimeters? It's minus five. So if she wants to do that and hold it out farther, you're gonna have to give her a stronger lens if she wants to hold it out farther. Because it's, it's opposite with, with hypros. With myopes, when you bring classes closer to you, they essentially get stronger. When you pull them away from you, they essentially get weaker. So to compensate for that, you have to add a stronger lens. Hence, minus five. All right, I know that gets a little confusing, you know, and, and I'm, I'm more than happy to, to give these slides out if you guys wanna look at them. Um, prescribing for children, myopia. Obviously, retinoscopy and cycloplegia are critical. Children tolerate cylinder really well. I mean, if, if it's like a five-year-old kid and they've got two diopters and astigmatism, a lot of times I'll just give it to them because um, they can usually tolerate it really well. Sometimes I will back off a little bit, but a lot of times I'll just give it to them. Um, obviously, you know, I'm a contact lens guy. Consider contact lenses for high minus or an isometropic eyes. Contact lenses, like we discussed last week, are really good, really good at helping to balance out an isometropic eyes. You know, you've got a minus two and a minus six. With glasses, sometimes that gets a little weird with magnification and vertex distance and all this stuff. Contacts really levels that out a lot better. Um, now, hyperopia is always a little trickier. Um, you know, if the hyperopia is high enough, the patient can't see distance or near. There's also a lot of strap issues, accommodation issues that go with that. Um, retinoscopy and cycloplegia are very critical, even more so. Because, um, you know, in a perfect world, you put them up to, uh, you know, an autorefractor and it spit out the prescription, you're good to go. But with hyperopes, it's usually a lot more complicated than that. Um, now, this is important. Except in cases of esotropia, cut the plus, okay? So, like, you'll have a kid, um, say six years old in first grade, He's been kind of complaining. You don't know if he's malingering or not, but you check the RX and he's a, he's a plus one. And then you cycloplegia him and you're like, oh shoot, he's actually plus five in both of his eyes. At, a, at age six, if they're a plus five, you should probably prescribe something. But if, they, if he doesn't have esotropia or any sort of strabismus or anything like that, um, then I'll always cut the plus. Because there's no way you're gonna give that kid a plus five pair of glasses and he's gonna tolerate it. He's just not. Um, he's so used to accommodating all the time, he'll put it on and be like, that's just too blurry, and I can't relax my accommodation enough. So you'll cut the plus. So cutting the plus basically means you back off by about a diopter in a lot of cases. Diopter and a half, sometimes two diopters. So in that case I just gave you, kid is plus five um, with cycloplegia. I'll prescribe maybe a plus four, maybe even a plus 350, just to get him started, just to, to train his eyes to learn to relax a little bit. And down the road, maybe next year, I'll, I'll bump it up to a four or a 450. But you gotta cut the plus. If they've got esotropia or any sort of strabismus, you gotta give them the full to try to help straighten out their eyes. Um, and then like I say, children often tolerate cylinder and I know, I know, I know some, an isometropia well. Um, oh yeah, I found, a baby's laughter is one of the most beautiful sounds you'll ever hear. Unless it's 3 a.m. and you're home alone and you don't have a baby. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. If there's nothing else you get from this lecture, this is what I want you to remember. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, are you guys doing all right? Like I see, I know, I know there's this, this lecture, when I started putting it together, I was like, oh man, I feel bad for these guys, because this is a lecture where I kind of wish I could split it up into two different ones, but you know, you, you do what you gotta do. Because uh, I mean, the section in this book is really big. Um, okay, so, accommodative problems. Um, You'll see these. So obviously, presbyopia, gradual loss of accommodative amplitude, you all know that. There's this thing called accommodative insufficiency, basically a premature loss of accommodative amplitude. They just can't accommodate as well as, as they probably should be. Um, near objects are really blurred. They get really fatigued. Um, you know, they talk about how they have to hold things out here. And this is, a lot of times, this is not even presbyopes. You know, you can get people in their early 30s, even their 20s, and they're like, man, I'm on the computer all day, but I get exhausted by the end of the day. I am so tired. And sometimes the reason why is they just can't accommodate very well. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll require additional reading plus power if they're already in, you know, progressive or something like that. 
And a lot of times it's just simply due to uncorrected hyperopia. Actually, another patient from yesterday, same thing. He's just like, man, I'm on the computer all day. I get so tired. He was 37 years old. Um, and we just found out his, his, his RX is like a plus 50 in both eyes. Not that bad. It's really not. But if you think about it, you're like, well, in order to see infinity clearly, he has to, he has to accommodate by 0.5 diopters. And then when he's looking at the computer, he has to accommodate another about a diopter and a half. So to see the computer clearly all day, he has to accommodate his eyes about two diopters all day long. And he's getting closer to presbyopia, so you can kind of see why he'd be getting more and more tired. Um, like I say, and a lot of times patients come in, they're 35, and they're like, I'm just not as comfortable as I used to be. And it's simply due because they're plus one and didn't even know it. They've been accommodating their whole life through it. And now it's kind of coming back to bite them. And then you have accommodative um, excess, another name for that is ciliary muscle spasm. They get a lot of headaches, kind of brow aches. Their distance vision fluctuates a lot. And this can be tough because, you know, fluctuating distance vision, that can be dry eye and a bunch of other things. But it could be accommodative problems where they're so used to accommodating all the time that it causes their, even their far away vision to fluctuate a lot. And it can occur after prolonged and intense periods of near work. So, Refracting these patients is, is kind of tough sometimes. You sometimes just have to cycloplege, even if, even if they're adults. Um, okay, ACA ratio. This is, another, this is another kind of good topic to talk about. Okay, so basically, the, the, you, you can get kind of into the weeds in this a lot, but just to kind of take a step back and overall look, basically how much do you converge when you accommodate? I had a professor that said, just keep in mind when you're looking at ACA problems, accommodation drives the bus. Always look at it as accommodation is driving convergence. Um, so basically, how much do you converge when you accommodate one diopter? So for a normal human being, the normal ACA is three to one, or five to one, three to one to five to one, there's, there's kind of a range there. So basically, and it's kind of reversed a little bit, for every diopter here, the second number of accommodation, this is how much your eyes are converging. Anywhere from three to five diopters. Okay, that's a normal human being. Um, so there's two ways to measure it. One's the heterophoria method. Uh, I don't think we'll worry about that. It's very rarely used, but I wrote it down. <coughs> then there's the gradient method, which is much more common. And there's kind of two different ways to do it using the gradient method. The, probably the easiest one is to stimulate accommodation. Basically what you do, so you do the cover test if you want. You're measuring the heterophoria. When, we'll do some examples of this. You're measuring it at distance. You add a diopter of, of minus over that eye. Oh, I mean over both eyes. So basically you add a diopter of minus so that that stimulates accommodation. And when it stimulates accommodation, it automatically stimulates convergence. And then you measure it again. The ACA is the difference between the two measurements. Okay? We'll go through an example of that in a second. The other one is you can actually relax the accommodation. Basically you show a target at 33 centimeters. So basically if a patient's corrected, correctly, then to see something at 33 centimeters, they have to accommodate three diopters. Okay, so right now, you know, right now my vision say is I'm emetropic. Right now to see my hand, I'm accommodating three diopters. And so what I do, set a target there, someone measures, you know, with cover test, what my header of four is, I'm XO, we'll say. And then you add three diopters of sphere to the phoropter. So basically now to see that point, I'm not accommodating at all. So I've gone from accommodating three diopters to accommodating zero. You measure it again, you get the difference, divide by three, ACA ratio. Again, don't be too concerned about that one. We're gonna talk more about the, the stimulated combination one. Okay, so we got Laquan has a measured for you at eight base in. So eight, so eight prism, so eight prism diopters of exophoria at distance. So when he looks off in the distance, he's exophoric by eight prism diopters, okay? Common. When you add <coughs> minus one diopter, you measure two base in. <clears throat> so I'm still exophoric, uh, but not nearly as much. So what, what, what's his ACA? ACA is six to one. That's a high ACA. So basically, for every diopter that I accommodate, I converge a ton. I converge six diopters. And, that, and that, that can lead you to problems, especially up close. Like if I'm looking at something really up close, and I'm converging just like crazy. That can cause double vision, that can cause eye strain, drive, drive me nuts. Flossy, let's do another example, has a measured foria of four base out at distance. So, you know, I'm esophoric at distance. After adding a diopter, you measure six base out. So basically you're saying, wow, 
you know, even though I added a diopter of accommodation, boy, their their uh, their header forty didn't really change much. I mean, they're still isophoric, but not not, not much different. So what's Flossie's ACA? Two to one. So the patient doesn't really tend to converge a lot for accommodation um, for every diopter of accommodation. And again, make and plane of ice train near in this case. You have some people that are it's called divergence insufficiency, meaning because their ACA is really low. <clears throat> They don't diverge very much when they're looking off in the distance, and so they can have distance vision problems. I have a question. Sure. What do you mean by can't put the doctor's isophore in the second line? Is that oh, I put that in wrong. Sorry. I had, I had copied the, the previous slide. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you caught that. Oops. So sorry, so that should be the top one. Four prism diopters of isophoria, six prism diopters of isophoria. Thank you for catching that. In fact, I should make myself note about that while I'm thinking about it. Because I'm just going to stop this lecture and I'm, I'm going to not remember. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, we got, got some of those weight here. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me see how much time I have left. Holy cow. All right. Um, so I have a question about that. Sure. So let's say someone does have a big the ratio way off, what do you do about it? So, the, the, <clears throat> honestly, the best thing to do is send them into a binocular vision specialist, like a vision therapy optometrist. Who, there, there's a lot of vision therapy techniques to kind of help train patients to converge better or converge less or to control the accommodation and convergence better. Um, there's a lot of methods you can do. Like, for example, um, just uh, you've got someone that got a low ACA ratio and so they're not converging a lot when they're looking up close. Um, what, I'll, what I'll talk to patients about is doing pencil push-ups. I know you guys have never heard of that. So you get a pencil, you hold out at arm's length, you stare at it like the tip of it, and you bring it closer and closer and closer and closer, and you try to keep it nice and sharp and clear. It's going to suddenly go double. Once that happens, bring it out, try it again. You're basically kind of teaching your eyes to kind of converge better and the accommodation to work better. That's kind of a Mickey Mouse thing that I prescribe, but they have found that pencil push-ups can actually honestly help patients. But that, that's something where you just kind of have to send them into revision therapy. Um, you know, you, you, I mean, you can do a few other things. Like, for example, say a patient doesn't converge very much with every diopter of accommodation. If, if you have to over minus in that case, maybe a little bit um, to kind of force them to accommodate a little bit more to kind of push convergence, you can do that. Um, or say they don't accommodate quite, um, or they accommodate too much, we'll say. So say their ACA ratio is six to one, they accommodate way too much for every diopter. You wanna make sure that you don't over minus that patient. If anything, maybe over plus, just so you don't stimulate too much accommodation so it just drives them crazy. But bottom line, I don't even mess with these patients a lot. I'll just say, you know what, there's a couple of optometrists I know do a lot of vision therapy, they're great, I'll send them over to them. Um, but yeah, I mean, pen pencil push-ups though, I mean, it, it helps a lot of kids, especially since it's really common for kids to, to not be able to converge very well, and, and sometimes their accommodation is a little off. Um, good question. Um, so I do have a few more minutes. Do you have any questions? Because I can go on to a couple other things, but unless you, you, you want to ask questions first, we can just ask a few questions and we can call it good. You good? Okay. So this, this will probably be the last thing I'll get to, basically accommodative amplitude. Basically, how much can a patient accommodate? What's the strength of their accommodation? The, it's the dioptric difference between the near point and the far point. Now the near, so we talk about the far point. Far point is how clear can you see without any accommodation at all? For myopes, it's right here, you know, for two diopter myope. The near point means if you are giving max amount of accommodation, how clearly, I mean, how, how closely can you see when you're maxing out your accommodation. That's your near point. When you can still see things clearly with full accommodation. Um, so myop, so yeah, so, I'll, I'll, so here's the far point of the myop. So the patient says, hey, you know, three centimeters or whatever from my eye, I can still see clearly because I've, I've, I've accommodated like crazy. That's their near point. Closer than that, it's all blurry because they, they just, they maxed out on their accommodation. Hyperopia, so you know, we talked about how their far point is behind the eye. When they accommodate, it, is, it essentially brings their far point up to the retina. So in their case, it's a little goofy, but their near point's actually, you know, it's here, but you're kind of 
you're kind of doing that. Um, no, let's skip that. Uh, da, 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 da. One last thing to kind of think in mind, I, I think we'll just do this. For, from the patient's measured accommodative amplitude, allow half to be held in reserve. So if you measure a patient and you, saw, you find out, hey, this person can accommodate two diopters, that's the max they can do it, um, then they can usually comfortably throughout the day accommodate half of that. So say you know this patient has two diopters of max accommodation, they can accommodate one diopter comfortably. You determine that Shenandra has 1.5 diopters of max accommodation, 0.75 may be comfortably contributed by the patient. But say she's like, you know what, I really like to read up here, up close, I like that. Um, and that's 40 centimeters away. Basically she's saying, boy, 2.5 diopters is, is what I really like. Well, in, in this case, she needs 2.5 diopters. She can, she can comfortably add 0.75. That helps you determine the ad. So in her case, you'd give her about a 1.75 ad. Because she can, she can contribute 0.75, but she really needs a 2.5. Okay. Anyway, so if, if any of you guys want you know, these slides, just let me know. Um, you know. There's a bunch of stuff, obviously, we didn't get to. Um, but, uh, you know, or read some, I mean, the book is honestly really good. It's just kind of a long section. I've tried to really condense it and make it as kind of simple and clinically applicable as possible. But um, if there's no other questions, I think we'll just call that good. Thanks for sticking with me. Um, I, I know a lot of these things, is, you know, you kind of have to trudge through it a little bit, but I appreciate your patience. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you.